So hello, everybody. I've, I've just heard from the office that we're about ready to start. Um, on our side, that means myself and, of course, my the moderators and the speakers, we are all very excited because this is actually a premiere. This is the first webinar by the tumor section. And uh, we're very excited. There are a lot of people who have registered. And we also think that we have a very, very interesting and, 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 and very central, we have chosen a very interesting and central topic for all of neuro-oncology, of course, gliomas. Uh, I just start making a few introductory remarks, and I think so we have enough time for the actual uh, talks and, and for the discussions, I will ask Christian to start with the moderation and with the first two talks. Christian, uh, I think you need to unmute. Oh, that's, em sorry, that's embarrassing after two years. Um, <laughs> So, hello from my side. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the first webinar on World Brain Tumor Day. And um, I also think we start right away. And I'd like to introduce Heidi Wörer from the Neuropathology in Vienna. She's Associate Professor for Neuropathology there. And she will um, enlighten us with neuropathology, genetics, and epidemiology of low and high grade glioblasts. Excellent, Christian. Thank you for this kind introduction. Let me share your screen, my screen. <laughs> I hope it works now. <laughs> okay, and thank you for having me. So this is the outline for my talk. I'm going to start with the, the basic concept of glioma epidemiology. Before I focus on the glioma types as they are defined in the 2021 WHO classification. So if you imagine a population of um, cancer patients, then obviously uh, primary brain tumors are rare overall. So they account for 25% of all primary brain tumors and roughly 80% of all malignant ones. But it's important to recognize, and this is the first take home message for you today, that glioma is a heterogeneous disease and we differentiate distinct subtypes. The most common and also the most fatal one being glioblastoma, which accounts for roughly half of all cases. And then we have a third of the cases, which we call or summarize as lower grade glioma. So those would be the WHO grade two and grade three tumors that include astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma. And just as a very small preview of what will come next, for astrocytoma, the grading has been updated. And we now also have a potential WHO grade 4 tumor here. But the reason why it's so important to separate or differentiate between those tumor types is simply because they differ in treatment outcome. So we have the best survival in oligodendroglioma and the worst survival in glioblastoma. By looking at the worldwide geographic um, variation, we do have the highest incidence rates in populations of European ancestry, very prominently including Europe, the Northern Americas, but also Australia. And even though our view might be a little biased, it's some, since some regions have poor or tend to have poor coverage by cancer registries, this notion is confirmed in the US population where we do have the highest rates in non-Hispanic whites, followed by Hispanics and black um, patients. And interestingly, but just looking at Hispanics, um, individuals that develop gliomas tend to have a higher admixture of European ancestry in their family trees. Another thing is age distribution. When it comes to gliomas, we feel there might be a B-modal distribution with a very small peak in the young ones, with, which might account for the genetic risk factors or some developmental alterations. But then we have the, the vast majority of all patients between 50 and 80 years of age. And this is typically an age range where we have cancers that are associated with lifestyle and, and environmental factors. And even though in glioma, the, the usual suspects such as smoking or obesity are no, not really risk factors, we do have positive associations for a higher socioeconomic status. And also there is some initial work that suggests a role for myelin plasticity and increased network activity. 
but clearly the age distribution differs by glioma type with the astrocytoma and the oligodendroglioma being more common in the younger adults and glioblastoma being clearly a disease of the elderly patients. But the second message that you get from these plots is that the, all those subtypes tend to be more common in male patients as compared to females. And this is probably not true in the younger ones, but really starts from the middle ages and extends to the higher ages and is most pronounced in glioblastoma. But the thing is that gliomas um, tend to be not only more common in males, but males also perform worse as compared to females. So we have better survival in female patients, which is also not true in the very young and not interestingly also not in the very old, but across all those middle ages. And again, the pattern is very similar in astrocytoma and glioblastoma here. So it's, it's fascinating to look into the reasons for those observed sex differences. And actually this, I just cite one paper here, a seminal study that, um, that found differences in treatment response at the phenotypic level of the MR imaging, but also at the tumor genomic um, level, in this case, looking at the, the tumor transcriptomes that were also, um, that could also be traced to the um, experimental setting and looking at, at tumor cells that were derived from male or female tumors and responded differently to treatment. So looking at tumor genetics or population genetics, there is a long list of tumor syndromes that might be also associated with glioma, but they really explain a very, 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 very small fraction of your adult patients. However, we have noted that some gliomas tend to run in families. And simply being the first degree relative of a patient with glioma will double your risk. There is no high penetrance risk variance there. <clears throat> And, and the most, most families show private mutations and develop tumors of the same subtype. But obviously, the vast majority of all gliomas occur in a sporadic setting. And when we compare many sporadic cases with many controls, then we get a list of risk alleles that will increase your risk of developing a glioma by a little bit. Let me just highlight one risk closer for you simply because it stands out by an increase in odds ratio to 3.5. This one maps to the long arm of chromosome 8 and it is interesting, it is associated with lower grade gliomas or IDH mutant gliomas, especially oligodendrogliomas. But simply having this risk snip in your germline, which means in every cell of your body and also in the progenitor cells, will modify the, the disease course from tumor initiation to progress, progression. So those patients that carry this risk SNP, they tend to present at, at 10 years earlier as compared to non-risk allele carriers. So interestingly, one major topic or theme that emerged from all those CHIVA studies is that those risk SNPs they are not randomly distributed across the genome, but they rather tend to pick those genes that also play a functional role in the tumor biology. And it's not surprising that the same genes also popped up from these large scale tumor profiling studies. So by looking at many, and these are several hundreds of patients with glioma, they really, there really emerged some crucial molecular markers like the 1P19 code deletion, the IDH mutation, and third promoter mutation. And what we've learned from those studies is that if we use this molecular information and we stratify the patients into risk groups, then this will have a better performance here as compared to a risk stratification based on histology alone. So together, both studies provided enough convincing evidence to change a long classification. And it led to the introduction of molecular testing and the concept of layer diagnosis in, in, the, in the 2016 update of the WHO classification. So what does this mean? For the first time, we were using histology plus WHO grade 
plus the molecular information resulting in an integrated diagnosis that draws upon all the different layers. So it's no big surprise that 2021 continued along those lines. And still there is a huge relevance of molecular testing, which has even been extended to more advanced um, profiling um, tests or testing methods, such as, for instance, and this is probably the most, or the most important change, DNA methylation profiling has been more broadly introduced as a technique. What is DNA methylation profiling? You're, you're assessing, so it's DNA methylation is an epigenetic mark that is heritable from one cell to its daughter cells. So looking at the DNA methylation of tumor cells will still give you an idea of the cell of origin. And this can be used to define the tumor subtypes as is depicted here in this TSME plot. Um, where so this is these are data from the DKF set from, from Heidelberg from the Heidelberg group by David Kapper and co-workers. And basically there is a machine learning algorithm that groups, in this case a random forest one, that groups tumors based on similarities in their DNA methylation profiling. And the resulting um, TSNE plot looks a little bit like a, like a starry sky where we, where you see all those distinct tumor types. So it's a very stable marker. It's also stable over time. So there are no major changes or not two major changes between primary and recurrent tumors. It's a single test that robustly works in FFP tissues and can be applied to many different tumor types. So it's not only a success story in brain tumors, but it works in sarcomas. It works also in epithelial types of cancers. So overall, it's a very good thing. So let's take a look at how the glioma types, um, what, 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 what changes have been introduced to the glioma types. And actually there has been a dramatic restructuring that led to a simplification. So if you're looking at the long list of the 2016 classification, though those tumor, tumor types here have been more or less collapsed into just three types here. And this is astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and glioblastoma. It has also been made very clear that those tumors which we see, that those gliomas which we see in the adult population, those are really distinct from the pediatric ones. And there are many pediatric um, type gliomas that are further um, separated into high grade and low grade gliomas. So let's go through the adult diffuse type gliomas one by one, starting with the astrocytomas IDH mutant. So we've dropped all those prefixes. So there is no longer a diffuse astrocytoma, it's simply astrocytoma. And another general change that has been introduced now is um, they are using Arabic numerals rather than Roman numerals just to um, be more consistent with other WHO classifications. It's a diffusely infiltrating astrocytic glioma with an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation. It's well differentiated, lacks histologic features of anaplasia, no or only very low mitotic activity. Then we have CNS WHO grade 3 astrocytoma. Again, we drop the anaplastic. We have all those features of, um, of a CNS WHO grade 2 tumor, but in addition we have this focal or dispersed anaplasia and significant mitotic activity. <clears throat> and then, and this is new here, we also have CNS WHO grade 4 tumors. So what is this? Those are tumors that either feature histological features that would have previously qualified for a glioblastoma, like a microvascular proliferation or necrosis. So those are the tumors which we've previously diagnosed as IDH mutant glioblastomas. So in this regard, the new classification is very distinct. So whatever is IDH mutant falls in the astrocytoma category. Another thing which is new here is that for grading, we also now use molecular information. And here the marker is CDKN2AB homozygous deletion, which would qualify an astrocytoma as being WHO grade 4. So let's look quite vice versa at the modifications that have been made to glioblastoma. So here 
it's strictly ADH2A type. But what's new is that it can also be diagnosed based on molecular features, which is a good thing. So it's essential that it's IDH white type, no H3 mutations. And it either has microvascular proliferation or necrosis, or in case of small biopsies, if those are not present, it's also sufficient if we have molecular um, markers for Euclidoblastoma like the third promoter mutation, EGFR gene amplification, or plus 7 minus 10 chromosome copy number alterations. Another thing which you, um, which you come across again and again is this format of essential and desirable features. So it's desirable to have also for the other cleomas a DNA methylation profile that is cons consistent with a Cleoblastoma IDH well type. And then last but not least, we have the oligodentogliomas, IDH mutant and 1P19Q codeleted as a diffusely infiltrating glioma that has IDH1 and 2 or 2 mutations. And, and this is now very clearly emphasized, a codeletion of the chromosomal arms 1P and 9Q, which implies that we would need a test method that would cover the entire chromosomal arms. So it would be more difficult to test, um, to test the codeletions using fish analysis, for instance. And when it comes to grading, actually many things have remained similar to the 2016 classification. So it's purely histologic um, criteria like high cellularity, cytological tipia, mitotic activity, microvascular proliferation, or necrosis, which would qualify this tumor as a WHO grade 3. Again, no anaplastic, and there is no WHO grade 4 oligodental glioma. So with that, let me summarize. I've introduced gliomas as rare tumors. We've seen some ethnic variation with the highest rates in those of European ancestry, we have incidence and outcome that are shaped by sex and age. So they are more common in males and males also have a worse outcome. We do have genetic risk factors that prominently include some risk loci, especially in the sporadic cases. We've seen large scale molecular profiling studies that have led to changes in the classification now resulting in a 2021 WHO classification that has restructured adult diffuse glioma into three subtypes. It has clearly separated the adult type gliomas from the pediatric type gliomas. It grades within the types plus uses molecular information for grading. So with that, let me thank you. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions here, but also you can contact me anytime via email. So thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for that great talk and a great overview. I think we'll have the discussion of the two topics afterwards. So I'd like to hand over to Alexander Radbruch. He's a professor and chair of the neuroradiology department in Bonn. And you might know him from several publications about machine learning in imaging and virtual contrast. So we're looking forward to your talk and then we'll have the discussion afterwards to all the Attendees, please make sure that you use the question and answer box for any questions. We will have plenty of time to discuss all those. Alex, happy yeah. to hear you. Christian, thanks again for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to join you today. Um, actually, to be very honest, my talk will not be too basic, but it will give you rather an outlook of you, what you might expect of your neuroradiologist in the next year. So I would guess that the majority of you are neurosurgeons, so you can bother your radiologists and uh, tell them tomorrow, well, I heard there's some new stuff coming. When is it coming in our clinic? Okay, disclosures. And uh, let me start with, actually, Christian already mentioned it, what is currently happening in radiology and what is happening in the field of neuro-oncologic neuro radiology. Uh, there are a lot of companies are coming, and uh, uh, this is just an example from the last uh, RSNA, Radiological Society of North America. So there are new companies and old companies, Bayer, Siemens, and the new startups, they are uh, actually created every minute, it feels like that. But 
the truth is also, uh, if I ask you how much on you, of, of you really rely on uh, AI within clinical decision making, it's probably nobody already is using it on a daily basis. So why is that? Bridging the gap. Let me give you a short idea of what I think will happen in the next year, what we will see in clinical practice and what you can expect from your radiologist. I will basically focus on three things, segmentation, new contrast, and radiomics, because those are the things that are basically mostly debated. Let me start with automatic segmentation. Of course, we've got the Raynor criteria, and that is basically what you expect from your radiologist. If, you give you, if you've got uh, the glioma or the glioblastoma, you want your radiologist basically to know, is it stable disease, is it progressive disease, is it partial response, or is it total response? So we do this uh, basically on the, uh, with the RENO criteria. And RENO criteria is still uh, in the, from the publication JCO in 2010 and progression is defined by, I cite from the article, by any of the following 25% increase in some of the products of perpendicular diameters of enhancing lesions. So how does it look like in clinical practice? This is an example of a recurrent glioblastoma and how should we measure it? So we can, measure it in this way. So this would be radiologist A. So it would result in a total of 22 uh, square centimeters. Or we can uh, actually measure it also in this way. So that would result in a square of 17 uh, square centimeters. And this is already a difference of 28%. So we would, even though it's the same, uh, it's the same patient and the same uh, point in time, we would uh, come here to the conclusion that we've got uh, uh, that we've got progressive disease, which does not make any sense. So how can we handle this? Uh, actually, I want to cite the work of my former, uh, Philip Kicking, he formerly worked in my group and is tonight, today leading the group in Germany, one of the most innovative minds in neuro-oncologic imaging. He published in 2019 a uh, very innovative approach of an automatic uh, assessment of these brain tumors. Uh, where we basically quantify automatically the enhancing lesion, the necrosis, and the flare edema automatically with deep neural networks. And in this case, uh, we can avoid another bias because uh, on, based on Raynor criteria, we always measure uh, the slice with the, with the largest diameters, which basically does not make any sense because the tumors are volumetric. So we need a volumetric approach. And uh, so this approach by kicking it out really right now because and, and also we could um with this approach we can also differentiate between necrosis and edema in 3d this is neglected usually if we only measure the diameters on the larger slices and to give you an idea of how this will what look like uh, this is what you get in your pack system what you can see on your screens and for example we've got this tumor here we've got and, and red is the Contrast enhancement in green is the flare edema. This is the necrosis. And then you can basically quantify the exact amount of uh, contrast enhancement and flare edema over time. So you, what you get is really a very thoroughly approach of how the tumor is developing over time. And uh, let me actually uh, increase this a little bit that you, and so this is basically what the clinicians get. And I think that is much more valuable than the written reports. We need to quantify our results. So basically, nobody cares if it's like uh, nobody cares about those taxes that radiologists write. We need to quantify brain tumors. So I think that's what we're going to see in the future. And to give you an illustration of this uh, looks like that's based on the publication in Lancet Oncology. Uh, we can, can see here the ground truth. This is the radiologist actually how, how he assessed the brain tumor, this is the prediction by the neural network. Uh, red this is the necrosis, green is the um, contrast enhancement, and blue is the flare edema, and the errors are neglectable. So this is the difference between the radiologist and the prediction. It's neg neglectable. And to tell you very much the truth, it is even that radiologists even harm studies. Like uh, you've got a very often, like if you've got different centers and you've got a multi-center stutter study, um, you've got different radiologists uh, that assess the images and they've got inter variabilities. So uh, this does not happen if you use the software. So I think this is something that's, that is much more reliable and which minimizes inter variability. And um, okay, 
Yeah, so I think that is basically extremely, and um, this is something we will see in the future, what definitely will happen. So as your radiologist, there is already software on the market right now, the Lancet publications already three years ago. So there is commercially available software already out there. I think that's the way we should assess brain tumors. Next step, new contrast synthetic images, virtual contrast image acceleration. This is also something I think we will see on the market soon. Um, this is one of our most cited papers where, that we published in 2019 from my group. At this time, I was in Essen, where we showed that we can basically replace gadolinium. We all use it for uh, glioblastoma imaging, uh, high-grade or low-grade glioma. And uh, this virtual gadolinium is calculated based on several sequences that are uh, that that are assessed without the use of contrast agents to show you the algorithms here with the input. Sorry, for, for example, flare T2, SWI diffusion, and based on all those sequences that you measure prior to contrast agent application, you can calculate the probability of which of of uh, if a voxel will show finally contrast enhancement or not. So this is still the the original. Uh, work that was published in 2019. We've got a glioblastoma here. Of course, we still see uh, some differences here between the gadolinium and the virtual gadolinium, but this algorithm improves based on the number of tumors he assessed. So I think this is something we will also hear much more about in the future. And to give you a broader look on this, I think it's not only replacing contrast agents. So basically the idea of artificial intelligence is in radiology, is that you can, at least in MRI, transform any sequence in, a, in any other sequence. Of course, there are boundaries, but for example, in studies, very often we've got the problem that one patient has got all the sequences, you know, you need the T1 prior to gadolinium, you need the T2, you need the flare, and then uh, whatever diffusion is missing. And then what to do with this patient? And very nice work here in Red Publish in Radiology from our colleagues Conti et al., they show that you basically can replace sequences with the right algorithms. So transforming any T2, T1 and any T2 and so on and so on. So this is something we will definitely hear more about. I don't want to talk too much about limitations, but there are limitations. And it is really complicated stuff that needs to be assessed thoroughly. Just to give you one idea what can happen if you don't do it thoroughly. This is an example you've got. Uh, this is not published in medical literature. It is from a conference from uh, the engineers, from the computer guys. So we've here we've got a, a real flare with a, with, a, with a tumor and that is transformed bas basically in a T1 uh, that does not show on the tumor. Uh, and so uh, the other, or the opposite here, that's the real flare and it's transformed in a T1 that basically shows a tumor. This is the real T1. So this is an extreme example. I just want to... Uh, make you aware that there is still technical limitation and it's complicated stuff. But my prediction is we will see it on the market sooner or later. So it will come. And also to give you an idea what will also come today, very a lot of uh, neurosurgeons have got the problem that they wait usually very, a very long time for the next MRI. So for example, if you want to schedule an MRI in our department, you have to wait at least until to September because there's really a shortage of MRI capacity. And why is that? An MRI examination takes around 30, 40 minutes. If you have got a very fast protocol, it might take 20 minutes. With the help of AI, we can accelerate this. So why not make an MRI in three minutes or in two minutes? So there is a lot of published. It, they started, basically, the first publication there was uh, with me, but we will soon see this also with brains. And one development that is very interesting, I want to make you aware of it, if you have a close look at this uh, publication. So who is one of the major drivers of this development? It's Facebook. <laughs> uh, why is that? Because there's the big money. If you can actually accelerate the MRI and MRI does not take 10 minutes, it does not take 40 minutes, but four minutes anymore. So you can do 10 times as much patience and you can earn 10 times more money. So like it or like it not, things will change here. Finally, very briefly, radiomics. What does it mean? Um, if you're interested in any kind of radiology, you will have heard about this. Uh, basically, the idea is of radiomics is that images are more than images, they are data. So the usual radiology report on a brain tumor basically assesses the edema, the, uh, uh, the contrast enhancement that we quantify 
uh, we quantify the edema on the contrast enhancement, but we can have a much closer look into the into the gray and uh, and black and white uh, dots of the images. And this is the example. And then we can have correlations with clinical parameters. And the idea of radiomics is that we can um, get correlations between specific clinical parameters and these texture parameters. This is an example of uh, that was also developed in Heidelberg. Um, we've got in the first step, we've got a segmentation of the tumor. Um, we've got several normalization techniques, and then we've got the feature extraction. And features might be not only the shape of a tumor, but also you can have a histogram of all the dots in the tumor. You can have a close analysis of the volume. You can have a look, are there noses in whatever direction? And you can have these texture features. That means you have a look at, at a specific voxel and you analyze what gray values do surrounding voxels have. And when you get all these features together, you get from one tumor, not one classifier, not two, but 10,000 classifier. And those were initial studies uh, where actually we assessed, can we uh, predict a response to anti-angiogenic anti treatment with this approach? Initial studies showed that there is a chance to uh, basically predict uh, overall survival and progression-free survival with the radiomics approach. However, a multitude of papers has been published on this issue on radiomics studies. And this is an example here, it stops in 2020. This is on radiomics and texture analysis. So it's basically exponentially. And the truth is uh, we got, we've got still promise there in integrating it. So I would, I would bet a lot of money that nobody is using it in clinical routine. There is still no integration. And the reason for this is in my opinion, standardization is a major limitation. Am I confident that this will happen one day? I don't know. So um, let me summarize. I wanted to give you an overview of what you can expect from your radiologist. Automatic segmentation, if you don't have it, you should get it. This is something we will see on the market. Forget about measuring diameters. Doesn't make any sense. It will change. We need to have done it. We need to do this automatically. New contrast, synthetic images, virtual contrast, image acceleration is something I'm sure we will see on the market. It will take a little bit more time. So the virtual contrast agent and synthetic images, I'm sure they will come, but uh, we will still, it will still need a little bit of time until we see it. Radiomics analysis, I am still not convinced that they will uh, be part of routine clinical imaging. Uh, time will show if we get more reliable parameters. Uh, me, uh, from having reviewed uh, whatever large amount of papers, I still see a lot of inter. Uh, I, I see a lot of variability that I'm still not sure so if we will be able to handle it. So I'm not sure if this will come. So I hope that I could give, give you a short overview of what's happening in the world of imaging. It was an honor to, to speak to, to so many neurosurgeons. Thanks a lot to my wonderful groups. I want to point out again, Philip from Heidelberg. He's today uh, leading my group there. He's uh, one of the leading minds here in uh, neuro-oncologic imaging. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Alex and Heidi, for that great talks. So for the discussion, I'd like to start with one question to you, to, to the both of you. Recently, rising incidences of gliomas have been reported in Europe. Is that due to the fact that it's actually a rising incidence? So should we look at our water, at our, I don't know, um, mobile phone habits, or is it due to the, the ubiquitous um, possibility of getting an MRI? What do you think? Okay, what's a neuropathologist first? <laughs> well, I would say the incidence in glioblastoma has been has been rising in, in um, elderly patients mostly, and this might be a combination of its of population aging, of the effect of population aging. So we we have a larger population um, that gets older, and we see also cancers in in those patients. It might also be a, a combination or contribution from enhanced diagnostic imaging and, and diagnostic procedures. Yeah, I, I would agree. Like, um, it's an interesting question, Christian. Um, if there is something true about this hypothesis that it might be also due to the uh, easier availability of MRIs, then at least I think we will see a further increase in the in the further future because uh, my my prediction is 
that <clears throat> the accessibility for MRIs will be much easier in the, in the upcoming years. So we can only guess. So it's only a hypothesis. Um, yeah, I, I would I would agree with with Adelaide that it's probably a mixture of both. But uh, if something is true about this side, I'm, I'm sure that we will see much more MRIs in the future. The, because uh, as I told you, like uh, the, the uh, AI will help to shorten examination times and we will have much more patients. We will have a much more, a much higher through, uh, uh, throughput. And uh, so, yeah, we will see. Perhaps next year's will give us the answer. But maybe Christian, we can ask you whether it's it also depends on the surgeons and they perform more surgeries on the elderly patients. Probably, probably yes. We are we are, we are doing more surgeries in, in elderly glioblastoma patients. We are doing less and less cases where we don't do anything anymore. That's one thing. But also, I'm, I'm, there's also been reported for lower grade gliomas, which is which is quite interesting because they they should actually all receive some kind of surgery or treatment. And um, it's interesting that we find more and more of them. I, I'd, I'd like to have a second question right away about that because I was discussing that with the French group a couple of years ago. They were calculating uh, the um, cost effectiveness of a screening program for low-grade gliomas. And what they, what they calculated for France is that if they screen 10,000 people and they find four incidental low-grade gliomas, then it would be cost-effective to treat them perfectly. What do you think about screening programs for low-grade gliomas? I think that the neuropathologic diagnostics are still um, less expensive or <laughs> Um, affordable as compared to treatment and to the neurosurgical procedures and maybe also the imaging techniques. So, and I'm not aware that such a calculation exists for Austria. It, it doesn't exist because it's, I think it's highly complicated. The French guys did that and they, they thought that they calculated that for treating four incidental low grade gliomas like perfectly in the incidental stage would actually be beneficial and cover the cost of the entire program. How do you see that, Alex? I would be skeptical that this calculation is correct, but okay, uh, because <laughs> MRIs are pretty expensive and at least now. Now, uh, honestly, um, that is kind of a tricky ethical question. Uh, we also, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm a little concerned about that everybody, uh, about the ideas of getting these MRIs because we also can Threat, we also can uh, uh, make people make patients anxious of diagnoses that aren't correct at the end of the day. And uh, usually I advise my residents, if you have got 100 patients, they've got whatever white matter uh, abnormalities in a slight or in very slightly manner. And then sometimes they write and they, they report differ differential diagnosis, two more cannot be excluded. And I think this causes a lot of harm because people are patients are super anxious. Um, so personally, I would be a little bit cautious about these screening programs, and at least we we need to uh, design them in a very cautious manner and really think in advance what to communicate to the patients to avoid to cause unnecessary harm. We have one more question in the chat for neuroradiology. What do you think the impact of this sophisticated imaging on the procedure of surgery would be? Uh, there are a couple of things that, are, that, that could be imagined. For example, you can, as I mentioned, the radiomics approach can also, so you can ask all kinds of correlations. For example, you could also ask like, if, is, it ben, is it beneficial to have a re-resection yeah, based on the texture analysis? Um, so that would be an, that would be a good example, and also it helps to to um, quantify also the results of the uh, of the of the surgery much better. Like uh, so, I, I think the the radiomics uh, approaches can be uh, used on all kinds of neurosurgery of, of all kinds of neurosurgery. Like I think the the question of if, if a patient should be reoperated is probably the most most intriguing uh, question. Um, but um, yeah, but also I think it helps to have really much more quantifiable, like how much uh, how much is the 
uh, contrast enhancement prior to the operation, after the operation. I think that helps to basically um, describe better how the operation worked and uh, uh, how it should work. I'd have one last question for the both of you. Just a quick comment actually for, that I'd like to have from you. I start with Heidi, how will technology change your speciality in the next five to 10 years? I think there will be a further increase in molecular techniques and they will deliver the results more rapidly. And we will see an increase in, in the liquid biopsies. Yeah, for us, it will totally change the way we work. We will have an, uh, we will have a decrease in radiologists, but uh, so radiologists will work more and more as uh, data scientists. We need to be able to integrate all data. And we need to be the ones who've got the overview of all these sophisticated techniques. I don't think that we will see radiologists measuring tumors in the future. That will be done by uh, neural networks. So work of neuroradiology and radiology will change dramatically. So thank you for both talks and the discussion. I'd like to hand over the moderation to Yiri to carry on with the surgical part. So thank you, Christian. Uh, so my name is uh, Yiri Barczyk. I work at the Kalinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. It's a pleasure to be moderating the next session in this webinar. And we have three very interesting talks. Uh, first, we will have Christine talking on surgical indications and strategies for low-grade glioma, followed by Rachel talking on surgical indications and strategies for high-grade glioma. And finally, we'll have David talking about all the toys that we as neurosurgeons like to use. So please welcome uh, Christine Jung from Heidelberg in Germany, surgical indications and strategies for low-grade glioma. Christina, I think you need to yeah, unmute yeah, yourself. Yeah, sorry for the delay. So, Yuri, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I hope everybody can see my screen. And it's a pleasure to open the surgical part of this interesting webinar following my, um, my, um, um, those interesting talks we just heard. Um, um, I will talk about surgery for lower grade glioma today, try to speed up a little bit. And this is our agenda for today. I would like to first discuss the goals and also the timing of surgery with you, then uh, talk about the challenges and strategies and finally give a brief outlook. So let's start with why we are doing surgery for low-grade gliomas. And the first reason is very obvious, but it's also very important. The minimum goal should be to, do, to provide representative tissue for molecular diagnosis and maybe in future times also for targeted treatment. And since not all lower grades enhance, it's very helpful to have some extra information, like in this case, a 18F uh, FET PET to sample the most aggressive part of the tumor. However, I think we all agree that whenever it's feasible, we should try to perform a maximum safe resection because this impacts survival, it impacts functional outcome, and it also facilitates or even defers adjuvant treatment. And I would like to uh, start with the prognostic impact of surgery first. Um, you all know that randomized control trials are not feasible and to some extent also not ethical. And that's why extended surgeries, at least from an evidence-based point of view, are still highly debated. So this is the best evidence we have so far. You all know these data. It stems from a well-known B-centric Norwegian study where due to the geographical referral practice, a pseudo-randomization was performed and with patients from hospital A receiving a biopsy followed by watchful waiting while uh, the other hospital just opted for early resections and the overall survival for those patients in hospital B receiving early resections was plus 8.6 years. However, in the meantime, and Adelheid has very uh, nicely elucidated upon this topic, um, the prognostic impact of glioma surgery has been challenged by the identification of IDH mutations, which also led to the definition of lower grade gliomas nearly by um, the diagnosis of molecular markers. 
And therefore, just recently, the Norwegian group presented long-term follow-up data for IDH mutant glioma only, but still after stratification for IDH status, overall survival was significantly prolonged and the rate of malignant trans uh, transformation was significantly reduced th for those patients in hospital B, meaning those patients who received early resections. So the next question would be if there is a prognostic threshold for the extent of resection or for residual disease. And you all know these data from UCSF. It describes a large volumetric analysis of low-grade glioma patients. And this study showed very convincingly that both the residual um, disease, residual tumor volume, as well as the extent of uh, resection positively impact on the overall survival, the progression-free survival, and also the malignant progression-free survival. And this is definitely a landmark study, but unfortunately, and obviously it's not stratified for prognostic molecular markers. So when it became evident that molecular characterization is necessary to obtain sound survival data, we analyzed our own cohort of molecularly characterized astrocytomas who grade two, and we found um, that uh, the IDH mutation status was the major prognostic factor for oral survival as it's depicted here, and a survival benefit for those patients receiving extended resections like it's depicted here was found, found only after we stratified our data for IDH mutations. So we really learned that um, molecular stratification is mandatory for surgical outcome studies. And finally, the GESCHEM study group, that's a consortium of six German IMRI centers, provided multicenter data from a large cohort of molecularly characterized astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas who grade two. And they found that there is a continuous, really a continuous association of residual tumor volumes depicted here and the extent of resection with progression-free survival meaning that the more you are able to take out, the better the progression-free survival would be. So next question is whether the prognostic impact of surgery is dependent on the molecular subtype, so whether you have an astrocytoma or an oligodendroglioma. And there are some studies dealing with this issue. There is uh, one study from a Dutch study group indicating that here in IDH mutant astrocytoma, survival improves even uh, with the highest levels of resection. That's the gross total resection cohort. And those are patients with um, less than five cubic centimeters disease. While for oligodendrogliomas, this is obviously not the case. And this points to the fact that the prognostic impact of extended resections may also differ with molecular subtypes. So finally, the question arises whether we can do better than gross total resection by going beyond uh, the visible tumor, visible on MRI, for instance, um, in terms of a super marginal or also super total resection. And I think you all know these impressive uh, resection cavities coming from a clinical series by Professor Dufault. Um, just recently, the group of uh, Professor Bello from Milan presented, um, published a larger series showing that progression-free survival for those patients with supramarginal resections as well as seizure control was significantly improved and neuropsychological outcomes and quality of life were comparable between patients with supratotal and total resections. So I would say in experienced hands, supramarginal resections are feasible and they are able to improve survival and functional outcome. <clears throat> and this leads to another important topic, topic in my opinion, since equally important as prolonging the quantity of time is also to improve the quality of time. And uh, there are many aspects to functional outcomes, such as neurological deficits, neurocognitive deficits, and seizure control, but also much more patient-centered outcomes like quality of life and also return to work. And uh, due to the lack of time, I would only like to touch upon one rather understudy aspect, which is return to work. And these are data from the Swedish registries. Yiri might know them well. 
showing that only half of the lower grade glioma patients receiving surgery returned to work one year after surgery, which is also a major socioeconomic problem. But there are also data from the Netherlands suggesting that the permanent, the time to permanent work disability significantly um, 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 was significantly prolonged for those patients receiving early resection as opposed to patients with biopsy and watchful waiting only. So another important issue is the timing of surgery. And I think there are many good reasons to perform surgery as early as possible. First of all, lower grades are not a stable disease since they continuously grow. And data from the French glioma network just suggested a mean annual growth rate of about six millimeters. So a second, I've already talked about the prognostic impact of early resections. Third, it's the earlier, the better. There are just recent data from the prospective um, German Lock Lee registry indicating that a three months delay of surgery negatively affects post-operative functional outcome. And finally, you never know what you get. In our own series of non-enhancing gliomas, suggestive, radiographically suggestive for a low-grade tumor, 44% of patients had a molecularly characterized IDHY type astrocytoma, meaning a GBM. So this altogether really strongly advocates early surgery. And uh, for the last few minutes, I would like to talk about the challenges and also some strategies in uh, lower grade glioma surgery. And one of the challenges definitely is eloquent tumor location, which accounts for more than two thirds of lower grade gliomas. And uh, so that you always have to balance the functional integrity against a maximized extent of resection. And another important challenge is the invasive growth pattern, which impedes intraoperative tumor visualization and also delineation, of course. So for preservation of function, you can make use of preoperative functional imaging like tractography or NTMS. Uh, you can use intraoperative mapping and monitoring and of course also wake surgery. And a meta-analysis of 90 studies, uh, including a large body of patients, was able to demonstrate that the application of intraoperative monitoring in glioma surgery significantly reduced the rate of late severe neurological deficits and at the same time increased the rate of cross-total resection. So this is really meaningful for our patients. Coming now to intraoperative tumor visualization, we have imaging techniques, um, which David will also elucidate on, like neural navigation, ultrasound, and IMRI, um, but also optical imaging techniques with a res resolution aiming at the cellular level of this tumor. And I will just briefly touch up on two of those adjuncts. So one obviously is uh, IMRI, this is, in our opinion, uh, the best indication. Low-grade glioma surgery is the best indication for IMRI. And of course, there are no randomized trials proving the efficacy or the prognostic relevance of uh, this adjunct. But uh, many studies suggest that the use of IMRI is a positive confounder of resectability in lower grades. And just uh, take a glance at the future. In my opinion, stimulated Roman histology um, has the potential not only to provide a digital pathology like it is the case today, but it is also able right now, and it will be uh, improved, <clears throat> able to identify different levels of tumor infiltration and therefore may serve as a cellular resection control. And at the same time, some groups are working on providing real-time molecular data, which may also influence our surgical decision-making intraoperatively in the future. So just to wrap up, um, we are experiencing a paradigm shift in low-grade glioma surgery from an era of biopsies towards early and, of course, maximized safe resections, which is also reflected by the current IANO guidelines. And we are already moving forward to exploring supermarginal resections as well as multimodal surgical approaches, employing the full technical armamentarium we have at hand. But I think already now um, there is evidence, or we have good evidence, that uh, all these efforts improve the quantity and also the quality of survival.
And uh, just to give you a brief outlook, um, nowadays precision medicine is, uh, is very sexy, it's a very hot topic. However, I think that glioma surgery and in particular for lower grades has always been a personalized medicine which is adapted to functional boundaries and maybe in the future also to the real-time detection of molecular markers and tumor margins. And I think we as neurosurgeons have to keep in mind that surgery will always remain a mainstay, not only in lower grade glioma treatment due to the limited medical treatment efficacy. So thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take your questions afterwards. So thank you, Christine, for this very nice talk. Um, I think in, we will take the questions once the session is, is uh, finished, right? So I think we'll move forward. And Rachel has unfortunately been called to the OR. We hope she will get back and deliver her talk on Hargay Goloma Glioma a little bit later. But let's continue with David. Uh, so David Netulke from Prague that will talk about the uh, different uh, technological aspects of glioma treatment. Uh, so please, David, go ahead. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am happy to join this group and uh, I will speak about adjunct technologies for glioma surgery. Uh, and uh, as it was mentioned by Yuri, uh, I will be speaking about the toys uh, for the boys. And we should not forget that a fool with a tool is still a fool. Uh, but uh, I believe there is a high value of our adjuncts and we should use the adjuncts readily and uh, uh, these adjuncts should be available. So uh, like history, uh, the previous generation uh, of, gener of neurosurgeons uh, tried to make an impression that we are precise in judgment of the extent of resection. I think uh, these are historical data and we know that we are not precise and we need to use our adjuncts uh, and uh, only with the adjuncts we can evaluate our extent of resections. Uh, but how and when to use the adjuncts? Uh, should we use the adjuncts in low grades or so-called high-grade gliomas in enhancing tumors or non-enhancing tumors? We always should uh, set a goal whether we want to identify the tumor or we focus on extent of resection. And uh, the hot topic is uh, which adjuncts uh, may be considered as uh, routine or almost obligatory versus optional and which tools and adjuncts are in research and experimental. Uh, I believe that the fluorescence, uh, and this is from the, the Stummer group, uh, it should be like a first, uh, first to learn about the glioma surgery in enhancing tumors, uh, to learn uh, the spectrum, uh, the peak of the spectrum, and how to use the fluorescence uh, uh, in your surgery. And uh, this is really a very basic uh, first year resident uh, about the fluorescence accumulation in malignant gliomas after administration of gliolan, uh, and that 5 ALA is converted to protoporphin 9, and we can use the filters and to see. Uh, to see, we can uh, we use the blue violet illumination and uh, we can distinguish the active part of high grade glioma. And we all know that the positive predictive value for this era of tumor is extremely high. It's almost 100%. Uh, and uh, we should all be aware how to uh, differentiate the strong and the faint uh, uh, fluorescence. And uh, looking to the history, uh, the uh, very important uh, study by Walter Stum, uh, Stummer, Stummer and the German group about 5 ALA and extent of resection. We should realize that there are only few randomized studies in neurosurgery. Uh, and even though that this was before, uh, before some changes in uh, genetics, typing, and uh, there are some limitations, uh, this uh, study should be highly acknowledged. And again, going to the basics, uh, there is a proof, there's proof that uh, the extent of resection is enhanced using the fluorescence, even though nowadays we would go for higher extent of resections, maybe in those years, like 20 years ago, uh, there was more skepticism about the extent of resection, but we have a proof that we also uh, increase the progression-free survival at six months. 
uh, more complicated topic uh, is uh, about the uh, sodium fluorescein. Uh, for me, uh, when I look at the data in the literature, uh, there is less scientific background and the studies uh, are not as good for uh, as for 5 ALA. Uh, we have the phase two study from Italy showing uh, the application of sodium fluorescein, uh, which is based on blood very blood brain barrier disruption in high grade gliomas. So we can use this uh, yellow fluorescence. Uh, it's available, but uh, for me, it's like a second solution. Uh, also, because there is only the phase two study and uh, uh, phase three study, uh, we need to see the results. So for 5ALA, we have a good uh, data for this. For me, uh, the level of data is lower. And what about the tools about intraoperative imaging? Uh, we can have a long lasting discussion whether intraoperative MR or intraoperative 3D ultrasound, what is better? And there are two different families, two different groups. And uh, uh, if you have the IMRI, you will be convinced that the IMRI is perfect. If you have the uh, 3D ultrasound, then you go for ultrasound. So how to deal with the data? Well, in the past, we had the cho uh, uh, choice of low field uh, IMRI, but we know that uh, it's the history. It's now about the high field or 3D ultrasound. And this is our setting in Prague. Uh, and uh, we, should we should not forget also very important study by the member of our group, by Christian Zemf uh, from, uh, from Bonn, from time in Bonn, uh, when he performed the randomized study on glioma surgery glioma surgery, and it was small study. It was before fluorescence, but it was uh, well-designed, uh, published, uh, published in Lancet Oncology. And uh, it was clearly showed that if we use our toy, as mentioned by Yuri, uh, we increase the, the extent of resection. So in intraoperative uh, MRI group, the extent of resection was increased. So, and it's again, randomized study, very good data. Uh, we heard about the German uh, study on IMRI and low-grade gliomas. Uh, this is another study from Japan from 2020, showing the impact of uh, IMRI in low-grade gliomas. And also to me personally, this is the best indication uh, to have uh, intraoperative scanning and uh, they were performing this group uh, resections after the IMRI scanning in 66% of cases. So they use it widely and uh, they showed uh, good data uh, about the extent of resection. Uh, I, I just want to show the case somebody would call it a simple case from the last week straightforward low-grade glioma in the frontal lobe uh, and this is uh, the scanning uh, uh, and uh, this is the bone wax which i use as a marker in the resection cavity and this was a small residual part of the tumor and to be honest after several years of or rather many years doing this glioma surgeries of course, I cannot distinguish this small part of the tumor and uh, I go for the resections after the scanning. So this is the best indication for me uh, and uh, it improves the extent of resections. So when we look uh, to the literature uh, about uh, intraoperative MR scanning uh, for brain tumors, there are totally different opinions. Uh, and for example, this paper, I. I recommend you to read uh, in Journal of Neuro-Oncology. Uh, this group is very confident that uh, the benefit of IMRI was shown, uh, great benefit in a variety of pathologies and patient populations, uh, and it's helping to extend, uh, uh, increase the extent of resection. What about ultrasound? I used uh, some slides from a friend of mine from Bratislava, from uh, Andrei Stenio. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge him because I'm not using the ultrasound myself. Uh, so when we look uh, how to use, uh, we have some good papers showing that uh, using the up-to-date ultrasound, we can distinguish not only the primary GBMs or GBMs, but also the low-grade gliomas. Still, for me, it's a bit tricky, but I'm not the, the user on daily basis of ultrasound. Uh, 
Uh, we have the advances uh, of ultrasound scanning interoperative. Uh, we have the contrast enhanced uh, ultrasound. And uh, I think uh, what should be mentioned that the uh, 2D ultrasound is the history. Uh, and uh, if we speak about interoperative ultrasound, we also always should speak about 3D ultrasound and uh, uh, the images from the, from the ultrasound should be fused with the MR scanning and then it's more easy for neurosurgeons to interpret the interoperative data uh, and to use it uh, as a real uh, time uh, technique during the surgery. Uh, there is a need for image rendering in stream planes, fusion of ultrasound with MR, uh, and then we have this type of images which are useful for neurosurgeons. Uh, the guys from Bratislava did a study on low-grade gliomas and 3D ultrasound, uh, and they were uh, able to show uh, the extent of resection to show the residual part of the tumors and to increase the resection based on interoperative 3D ultrasound. Further on, uh, there are the studies that even the small perforators, uh, even the lenticular straight arteries may be depicted by inter high quality 3D ultrasound. But of course, there are some problems. Uh, and again, I will not go into all the problems with the uh, interpretation of interoperative 3D ultrasound, uh, but uh, there are artifacts most prominent in acoustic enhancement artifacts. Uh, these artifacts appear uh, after some tumor resection when ultrasound penetrates through higher column of water, and then uh, the image may be blurred like in the past. There are some techniques how to avoid it, uh, how to avoid the saline and how to change the saline, uh, but uh, it still may be a uh, critical part of the ultrasound scanning. Uh, development, yes, uh, we have uh, the development uh, of uh, interoperative 3D contrast enhanced ultrasound and even better depiction and delineation of the tumor lesions uh, like here on this paper. So how to compare? Is it possible to compare the fluorescent, 5ALA, IMRI and all these techniques for the, for the boys? Well, it's tough. Uh, uh, I look at this uh, paper in Journal of Clinical Neuroscience, and this group from US you, uh, compared these three categories. Uh, they looked at almost 500 papers, but they came up only with the 23 records and only 2,600 patients. So it's a small cohort uh, for the whole literature. Uh, they were able, clearly able to show that. 5-FLA, application of 5-FLA is better than control, so fluorescein better than control, IMRI better than control, but then comparison from 5-FLA and fluorescein, well, no significant uh, difference, 5-FLA and, and IMRI, again, no significant difference. Uh, they try to make the hierarchical ranking and uh, when they looked at the gross total resection, uh, the impact of the IMRI was the highest. On the other hand, when they looked at overall survival, then fluorescein sodium had the highest impact. And when they looked at the progression-free survival, again, IMRI. So based on these data, we see uh, the answer is not clear, uh, and it's really tough uh, to evaluate which technique is the best. But of course, any adjunct technique is superior to control. Uh, and as mentioned, all these techniques helps to increase the or to achieve gross total resections and also uh, progression free survival. Uh, is it so clear? Well, uh, when we compare uh, the IMRI and uh, intraoperative ultrasound, and on purpose, I leave the whole conclusion here on this screen. Uh, this group uh, from Italy uh, doing the primarily the pediatric brain tumor surgery made a rather strict conclusion to me. Uh, they, they supported uh, the wide uh, spread of uh, intraoperative ultrasound, uh, but they also uh, made a statement that worldwide diffusion of the IMRI technology of ultrasound uh, is better instead of making titanic economic efforts to acquire IMRIs. 
Uh, well, uh, this would need uh, more time for discussion. Uh, and of course, uh, IMRI is more expensive, uh, but uh, I would not make and draw such a strict uh, conclusions. I would uh, recommend all the followers uh, to go to this uh, review about the fluorescence guidance and interpret agents, uh, the group from US and uh, Walter Stummer. Uh, and they made a very reasonable comparison that fluorescence guided surgery, we know it helps to delineate the tumor and it's a direct visualization, visualization of tumor during the surgery. Uh, there are some limitations, of course, it's superficial imaging and there, are, there may be problems in low-grade gliomas, that's very obvious. IMRI, uh, the limitation, of course, is increase of surgical time and availability and the cost. And some artifacts of residual tumors and the surgical field, uh, but on the other hand, we know that the imaging that we use for the preoperatively and postoperatively, so that's very standard for us neurosurgeons. Ultrasound, it's available, it's cheaper, it can identify superficial and deep tumor, but we know it's somewhat uh, dependent on experience and user. Uh, and uh, there may be lower sensitivity for the residual tumor. To be honest, as I mentioned, this is a very good review. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I don't understand how, why to add the mapping. The mapping is obligatory for me, uh, and uh, it's very obvious that we need to map uh, during the surgery. So I would only focus on the adjuncts uh, for the extent of resection. Uh, uh, it was mentioned there are some perspective. Uh, like uh, optical coherence tomography. Uh, there is a need for further research, uh, how to delineate the tumor during the surgery, uh, but it's more about uh, experiments and research nowadays. Uh, the Raman spectroscopy was mentioned. So there is, there is clinical application, but uh, it's not yet uh, to the state that uh, everybody should use it. Uh, size came with the confocal microscopy, intraoperative uh, confocal microscopy. So let's see whether we will use these images uh, and uh, use this technique uh, during the surgery. It's possible, uh, but uh, I would not consider this as a standard. So adjuncts again for the boys, uh, for low-grade gliomas, I highly recommend to use IMRI or uh, intraoperative ultrasound. Uh, it's impossible to decide which technique is superior. Uh, and fluorescence, uh, it's a matter of discussion uh, how to delineate the sus suspected anaplastic foci uh, in uh, uh, tumors which are not enhancing. For me, in high-grade gliomas or contrast enhancing uh, uh, gliomas, it's almost mandatory to use the fluorescence. We may discuss which fluorescence, but for me, the better data uh, are for 5LA. So we use always 5LA. Uh, I see the value and uh, it's uh, described in the literature uh, that there is a value of IMRI scanning in high grades as well and intraoperative ultrasound, uh, but uh, we should be reasonable. It's not available everywhere and we do not have randomized studies on this or well uh, designed randomized studies and large studies. So I would consider this as optional adjunct. Uh, it's everything about the availability. There is no war between the adjuncts. Uh, I think the best uh, is the combination. For example, in Prague, we combine the fluorescence and IMRI, uh, but uh, in the other groups, they combine the fluorescence and intraoperative ultrasound. And I believe, I strongly believe that we should take the best from different techniques. Thank you very much. So thank you, David, for this very nice talk. Um, unfortunately, Rachel has so far not returned from the OR. Hopefully she'll be uh, able to present her talk at the end of the session or end of the webinar. Uh, but I think we should continue with the Q&A. And um, I think I have the privilege to ask both of you um, the first question. Uh, I mean, we heard, uh, uh, we heard the two excellent talks, obviously. Um, but my question is more on a personal, on a personal note in um, Rachel, so to, to Christine and to David, let's say from 10 years from now, how do you uh, visualize or see 
uh, the future to be like. I mean, both of you delivered excellent talks on the state of the art, the current evidence, right, guidelines and all that. But uh, maybe first to you, Christine, in low-grade gliomas, 10 years from now, how do we operate the patients? Do we operate them? How should we operate them? What do you think the future will look like in your per own personal opinion? Yeah, well, I, I, I try to give an outlook on this point. I think we will definitely offer surgery for those patients, at least if uh, the location is, uh, is allowing surgery, aggressive surgery. And of course, if the patient's wish and condition is, um, is allowing this uh, surgery, um, functional boundaries are the most important issue, that's for sure. And, and therefore, we're talking about adjuncts. We like to talk about the tools, not only for the boys, but also for the girls. <laughs> um, we like to talk about adjuncts, but still, I think function is the most important issue. And um, I'm not sure if everybody needs IMRI. I don't think so. If you're experienced in one technique, let it be ultrasound or whatsoever, it's better than doing have a fancy, a fancy tool and use it two or three times a year. That's, that's uh, my first statement. And I really think that it, um, the, the, the molecular, the intraoperative molecular diagnosis will bring us forward and also shifting the uh, intraoperative visualization to a more cellular, um, based approach, not to an imaging approach like ultrasound is or IMRI is, because those are only surrogate markers for, for tumor margins. So yeah, that's, that's my vision. But I'm pretty sure that we will uh, do surgery, especially on low grades. And hopefully as early as possible. <laughs> so what's your opinion, David? Well, I'm very Sorry, but my opinion is almost in line with yours. So it's hard to get any controversy. Sorry for mentioning only the boys, of course, for the girls, the toys. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, we will stay with as aggressive as possible surgery. Uh, in the past, I heard, well, in 10 years, for example, my predecessor uh, tried, uh, said many times, well, in 10, 20 years, there will be no glioma surgery. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, nonsense. We will be doing the surgeries and I see there will be a value, as you also mentioned, the optical coherent tomography, Raman spectroscopy and uh, these, uh, these methods. And uh, of course, the integration of molecular biology uh, and uh, testing is very obvious. But I am very much convinced we will be balancing the aggressivity and we will be aggressive. And as you mentioned, the function uh, is uh, the key issue for our patients. And a quick follow-up question to both of you uh, in terms of low-grade and high-grade glioma, supramarginal resection, is that something you think we'll be seeing more in the future? Uh, probably, but I think, uh, and I try to point that out, you need a lot of experience for that. Of course, you can go beyond the visible um, tumor margins, but uh, the groups I mentioned have a vast experience in doing intraoperative functional outcome, meaning not only testing uh, speech language or just uh, moving the leg or the arm, but that's also a neurocognitive outcome. And um, Especially in, in lower grades, Adelheid has already mentioned this, it's a rare disease, so maybe not, not uh, every hospital should start uh, doing supramarginal resections in lower grade gliomas because the caseload is too, too small. And you really need to have experience in doing intraoperative functional testing. Uh, my point for time being, uh, I'm very cautious about supramarginal resections uh, due to same uh, arguments as mentioned. And uh, for example, if we perform awake surgeries, we do perform awake surgeries, but our group is not able so far to deliver such an excellent data about neurocognition during the awake resection. At least uh, in Prague, uh, we are not that far, to be honest. So we monitor the basic functions, but we tried several times the test for the neurocognition, but uh, it was not uh, running uh, easily in our setting. So uh, I go for MR radical resection whenever possible, 
but I, in our setting, we don't go for super marginal resections. All right, thank you both for the answers. I can just point you to an, an interesting, there's actually a Nordic RCT study that's been recently initiated on high-grade gliomas on randomizing between standard resection of the contrast-enhancing tumor or uh, contrast enhancement plus one centimeters as a supra marginal. So maybe in a couple of years, we'll know the answer and the potential plus, uh, for, so to say, plus and cons and, and pluses for this kind of technique. But let's go to the q and I believe that I've been told that we have a couple more minutes. So there's one question from Nikolai Tonchev to Christine. What should be the standard diagnostic package for young patients with suspect of low-grade glioma MRI plus plus before offering a gross total resection? Maybe uh, the standard MRI package, I can give this question back to, to Alex. <laughs> Maybe he's the most experienced uh, in, the, uh, in the panel. Um, I would say if it's, if it's obvious that it's a mass lesion and uh, we've already discussed that, there are a lot of incidental findings and findings where you can mistake a tumor for inflammation or vice versa maybe. If you're not sure, you should do a follow-up scan. That's first thing. Um, otherwise, it really depends on the location of the tumor, of course. If you do uh, functional imaging, if you have to do functional Im imaging pre-op, for instance, in left-handed patients with right temporal tumors, do an fMRI to see lateralization, things like that. Some groups have a lot of experience by doing NTMS, but re this really depends on the location of the tumor. And of course, it's, it's warranted to do neurocognitive testing, but I totally agree that uh, not, not, not every department is, is ready to do so. Yeah, perhaps I can, I can, I agree with totally what Christina said. It's interesting that it's, it's raining heavily here. Perhaps you might, you might, might hear it, like the sun is not shining always in one. Uh, so I, uh, that is a very wide question, what kind of tumor protocol you will have uh, a lot of different answers from all the radiologists all over the world. So uh, let me tell you here, of course, we've got the, the contrast enhanced T1, T2 flare. Here we use perfusion. For example, if you go to the University of Clinic, they mostly use to the University Clinic of Essen where Martin works. They don't use uh, tumor perfusion. They use PET mostly. So uh, that varies or also a little bit from side to side. And um, and tumor fusion, oh. perfusion as well now, Alex, of course. Yeah. You, you have left now and tumor perfusion is, is established. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. So that's really a long story. Like we've got the whole debate with pseudo progression and uh, there are like hundreds of papers written which sequences should be best used for a differentiating pseudo progression and reprogression. Uh, so my, my opinion, a good tumor pro protocol contains T1, T2, uh, with contrast agent flare, uh, diffusion, and perfusion, and SWI. But that's my personal, that's what I personally think. And of course, I also value the, the, the additional value of PET, which is very often useful. Is there a value, Alex, for tumor perfusion for low grade glioma? Yeah, that's also uh, debated a lot. Like there are studies that. Uh, retrospective studies that evaluated if we can predict uh, time to malignization, but I would say the data here is not sufficient for really saying that there is an additional value. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks to all. Let's jump to a question to David. So there's a question from Alan Sarich. Are there differences in complications in terms of quantity and type and post-operative functionality in patients in different adjunct techniques? Well, best of my knowledge, uh, uh, there is no significant uh, study which would show that one adjunct is uh, inducing more complications. Uh, going to 5LA, of course, we have the data from a randomized study and uh, we should be aware uh, that we should not fight for the violet always. We should uh, consider the function and everybody was trained for that. Uh, but when I looked uh, at the studies for IMRI, uh, 
uh, I, uh, in our setting and also in the literature, uh, the data show that there is no significant increase of morbidity uh, if it is used wisely. Uh, again, it, everything is not the image. Sorry to radiological group. Uh, it's about the function. Uh, and uh, com when I don't know the studies comparing the, for example, sodium fluorescein and 5LA, that one fluorescent dye would be uh, more risky than the other one. Uh, it's still in our hands and we should use our brains uh, and not only follow any fluorescent. So uh, to me, there is no significant difference. Thank you. I think we have time for one final question. Uh, let's see, there's a question from Henry Cole. This is to Christine, I believe. Uh, if you advocate supramarginal resection, why to do intraoperative MRI? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, well, in, in lower growth, Rates. Um, um, I don't advocate IMRI in supramarginal resections. Maybe that was a misunderstanding. Um, maybe not not for the supramarginal resections. It's it's good for update of neuro navigation or also for um, training purposes, obviously. But in supramarginal resections, you really have to know where the function is. And uh, as I said, IMRI is very is just a surrogate marker for uh, for tumor, so that's maybe not the best indication to do so. All right, thank you for answering, Christine. I think it's time to move on. Uh, I think I will pass, pass on to Matthias for the introduction of the next two speakers. Well, thanks, Jerry, and then I will start with the last session of this uh, webinar. And it's quite interesting. We talked so much about the benefits of resection, even about supramarginal resection. So it might seem that, uh, uh, well, all the problems in the glioma world are just solved by surgery, which is certainly not the case. And while being a neurosurgeon, I'm very proud that in the last couple of years, we've been able to come up with a lot of data showing that it is actually helpful what we are doing. The other really great impact in the last 10 to 20 years to the glioma world has come from the world of adjuvant treatment. And this is, I think, uh, the state of the art is what we're going to learn today. And uh, by listening to a talk from Martin Glass, who's from the University of Essen, working in the neuro-oncology and neurology department. Martin, happy to see you. And uh, we are all excited listening to your talk. Yeah, thank you, Matthias, for the for the introduction. Um, just try to share my screen. And thank you for inviting uh, and thank you for inviting uh, me as a neurologist. I mean, uh, it's it's it's. I think it's it's always risky to invite neurologists in a, a neurosurgical webinar. And yeah, let's see um, what happened. Um, I, I try to run through the adjuvant uh, treatment recommendation. And uh, the, uh, I was asked to, to do it basically, so not so many uh, clinical trail there. So uh, let's see. Well, when we talk about brain tumor therapy, and I think especially when we talk about adjuvant uh, therapy, we have to fight a lot of, uh, I think, prejudice. And the so-called critics or brain tumor experts um, uh, are convinced that there still is a um, uh, kind of uh, therapeutic nihilism. So the question I think is legitimate here do we have a standstill or progress in the adjuvant therapy? And my answer, I think, is, is, is quite clear. I think we have a progress in the field of neuro-oncology. Um, and the, these numbers, I think, uh, illustrates you quite well um, that we have made, I think, a tremendous progress in, uh, in the efficacy of adjuvant therapy and all the other treatment regimens, of course. Um, you can see here the survival rates, two-year survival rates for glioblastoma patients. And I think most um, uh, impressively, we have a sevenfold increase in the in the last twelve years by combining several methods using new molecular markers and whatever. Um, yeah, these are the treatment uh, pillars of brain tumors. You're all aware of it. I think it's 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 uh, I think important to know that we have four different pillars. Meanwhile, surgery, of course, radio oncology with the different modalities proton, photons, and whatever. And then the adjuvant part, systemic tumor therapy, which is not always a chemotherapy. It consists of immunotherapy, molecular target therapy, and whatever. And um, the fourth pillar, um, which is think, quite, quite well established in the last year, especially for glioblastoma patients, the, new, the use of um, so-called tumor treating fields. 
Let's start with the most malignant um, brain tumor, glioblastoma. This is a typical MRI example. Um, how do we treat these patients? And um, I think you know that um, uh, for almost 18 years in 2005, or 17 years in 2005, the so-called Stup scheme was established. And this, um, uh, this um, regimen still is somewhat um, uh, standard of care with some modifications. You know, after cross-total resection, whenever it's feasible, um, we treat the patients with a combined um, radiochemotherapy with temozolomide. You know that temozolomide is an alkylating compound uh, orally administered. Um, and um, uh, we start with a um, uh, concomitant treatment phase, six week, usually we use six week for the, um, except of the elderly patients, of course, six week of our radiation every day during the week, not during the weekend. And from day one to the last day, we administered um, uh, concomitant temozolomide even during the weekend, uh, 75 milligram per square meters, um, as I told you, every day. And then after a four week um, um, treatment free uh, interval, um, we use up to six cycle maintenance or adjuvant temozolomide, a different um, regimen, five days chemotherapy, 150 to 200 milligrams per square meter, um, followed by um, a 23 uh, treatment free interval. This is um, one cycle. So um, with this regimen, um, uh, survival times, um, are approximately 15 to 20 months, depending, of course, on the MGMT promoter methylation status. You know, the methylated patients um, have better prognosis up to 31 months of survival time. Well, in the last years, there was a heavily discussion um, how long should we treat um, uh, this patient, how long should um, patients stay on temozolomide? And, um, six cycles or 12 cycles like we did in the ATOG trial or open-end uh, um, temozolomide like we did it at the very beginning 20 years ago. Um, I think since the publication of a meta-analysis and since the publication of a random Spanish randomized phase two trial, the answer is, is, is quite clear at the moment. We recommend to use um, six courses, six cycles of temozolomide and, and, uh, and not more since there was no clear uh, prolongation of survival, but there was a clear increase of um, toxicity. Um, well, when we talk about the progress we have made in this field um, since 2005, since the publication of the STUP scheme, it's important to know that um, more than 20 randomized phase three trials were published or conducted with stop scheme as a control arm and with an experimental arm and the aim to prolong the survival time. And um, you all know that um, many trials missed um, to be positive, except of two trials, including younger patients. One of them is the ear 14 trial. I, I think you, know, you all know this, uh, this trial. Um, um, this is a trial where we use a um, tumor treating fields in the adjuvant setting, additionally to um, temozolomide, um, uh, um, uh, treatment regimen. Um, yeah, a few words to, to, um, to tumor treating fields. Um, you can see these, these kind of arrays and these, these arrays uh, should be placed on the uh, um, shaved scalp and every array consists of nine different um, uh, ceramic discs. And on every ceramic disc, um, there is an, um, it, the amicaramic disc is able to, to alter plus and minus pole more than 200,000 times per, per second. And um, if a tumor cell or tumor is in this um, alternate electric field, um, there are many preclinical data, um, then this could inhibit mitosis, cell division, migration, uh, lead to apoptosis and whatever. And uh, years after the preclinical data they conducted, uh, Roche Stup as well, the A14 trial um, uh, with control arm, the ordinary Stup arm, um, six sites of adjuvant temozolomide compared to the combination of tumor fields and um, temozolomide. And well, this was a huge study in many sites worldwide. And to make this long story short, um, it was a positive trial. The addition of tumor fields resulted in a prolongation of survival time. And I think more interestingly, more impressively, um, and this results in an increase of the survival rates. If you look at the five-year survival data, you can see that um, in a, together with tumor-treating fields, approximately every seven or every 
eight patients um, could survive five years or longer with temozolomide monotherapy only every 20 patients. You know that there's a lot of discussions about quality of life and treatment with tumoritic fields and whatever. Um, the only thing we can say at the moment and the only academic uh, um, data we have um, showed that the quality of life is co was comparable in this trial in, in both, both arms, except of itchy skins, which is a result of the moderate skin toxicity of the arrays. And, uh, but of course, this trial, like many others we did in the field of neuro-oncology, left us behind with some questions. In this case, we are discussing the role of placebo because this trial and you know, many other trials, as I mentioned, were not placebo controlled. This is the second trial we did um, during my time in, in, in Bonn. There's a German trial um, of the neuro oncology um, uh, working group um, for clidobrastoma patient, biomarker driven for the MGMT promoter methylated patient. The trial was called a CTEC trial. Um, this trial uh, uh, compared the stoop scheme with an experimental setting combined of radiotherapy and the combination of lomestine and older nitrosiurea combined to temozolomide in the 40, um, 42-day uh, courses cycles, um, and we used up to six cycles. Well, the survival data, I think, are really impressing with um, uh, um, survival prolongation of approximately 17 months. Um, and almost every second patient um, could survive four years um, or longer. When we combined two different uh, uh, chemo compounds, toxicity was higher, of course, but it was manageable and, um, and moderate. Um, yeah, this trial as well, not placebo controlled. This was a small trial, 128 um, a patient. And um, one of the issues here, or the main question here, um, we could show or demonstrate a um, prolongation of, um, of, of all survival, but not of progression-free survival. This question is still remaining. Um, well, this is an overview and recommendation how we treat glabastoma patients. Um, I haven't shown you the data for the elderly patient, but um, the recommendation is to distinguish between younger patients and elderly patients. The cutoff would be 65 or 70 years approximately. And for the elderly patients, we use modified regimens, hypofractionated radiotherapy, usually three weeks regimens. And depending on the MGMT methylated state that we uh, use temozolomide or for the unmethylated use, not temozolomide. In, in the whole setting, um, we discussed the addition of two moderating fields. And for the younger patients, stoop scheme, as I told you, uh, still is kind of a standard of care. And in case of methylated patients, at least in, uh, in, in, in Germany, we discuss this uh, combination regimen, the CTEC trial, plus minus two more treating fields. So um, how about the, how is the situation for the grade two and grade three gliomas? This is the complicated algorithm or pathways for grade two to four gliomas. And I try to uh, guide you through these um, through these pathways. Um, well, first of all, we have to um, detect: do we have a IDH mutant tumor or not mutant tumor? If if this is the case, if we could detect uh, IDH mutation. The next question would be, um, at least from my clinical side. So I apologize to all the neurobiologists. Next question would be: could we detect a one p ninety q co deletion? If this is the case, I think the recommendation is, is quite simple, since uh, um, we could um, make the diagnosis of oligodendroglioma. And then in case of a two, grade two or grade three um, oligodendroglioma, um, there are many trials that demonstrate that if we treat this patient, we should combine radiotherapy plus a combination of uh, different chemotherapy agents. In, in this case, um, we recommend the PCV um, uh, regimen. The BCV regimen consists of two important compounds, lomestine and procarbacine, uh, pro and vincristine, which we avoid to administer since uh, this compound is not able to penetrate the blood brain barrier, but could induce in, in, uh, in many cases, it depends on the dose, dosage, um, uh, peripheral neurotoxicity. Um, with this regimen, the prolongation of progression free survival, I think it's, it's quite impressive. PFS3. 13 years compared to 4.2 years for grade three oligodendrogliomas with the radio monotherapy. For grade two gliomas, same um, recommendation, but we treat this patient only in, with the presence of risk factors, um, age older, um, uh, 40, um, 40 or older, 
plus minus um, uh, um, presence of re residual tumor, which means biopsy or partial tumor resection. So next subgroup, um, IDH mutant tumor without co-deletion. Um, astrocytomas would be the diagnosis. And um, as we have heard from the, because the first talk, I think, um, next molecular marker, I'm so, sorry for this, um, um, uh, it's the fault of the neuropathologist with so many molecular markers. Then we have to detect, I think, whether there is an, a CDKN2 AB deletion or not. If, if there is no deletion, then we have a grade two or grade three astrocytoma. Um, the recommendation based on a quite complicated trial, the, the, uh, the, the uh, um, so-called CATNON trial, four-armed um, uh, um, randomization of radiotherapy versus radiotherapy plus concomitant temozolomide, third radiotherapy plus adjuvant, 12 cycles, unfortunately, of temozolomide, and altogether radiochemotherapy is concomitant adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. And it was um, uh, shown quite clearly that in, in case of a grade three astrocytoma, these patients do benefit um, from a combination of radiotherapy plus 12 cycles of temozolomide. So this is a clear indication for this tumor. And um, the same recommendation, um, uh, um, I think with some limitations because the, the clinical trial um, uh, was performed not with temozolomide, it was performed with uh, PCV, but um, in clinical practice, we treat create two astrocytomas with risk factors, 14 years or older, plus residual, plus minus residual tumor with, with the same regimen. But the PCV regimen could be discussed as well in this scenario. So many questions are remaining based on the CATNON trial. The role of the concomitant um, temozolomide treatment is not clear, um, was negative in the, in the CATNON trial, and how, how to treat um, uh, IDH uh, wild-type patients. There were several patients in this CATNON trial um, had an IDH wild-type status. And uh, the problem we have now is that in this trial, these patients did not benefit from an additional, uh, from an adjuvant, um, uh, temozolomide regimen, even in the case of a methylated MGMT promoter. And even in the case published a few months ago, even in the case of um, some molecular markers that allow to, to diagnose these tumors as clyoblastomas. So this situation is different to, to um, uh, clyoblastomas. And uh, to be honest, we don't know at the moment why, but this is only a single trial with, with a limited uh, subgroup analysis. So I think we have to, to do some research in, in, in the future to, uh, to address this, uh, to this issue. Um, but nevertheless, treatment recommendation for these tumors would be um, treat these tumors like astrocytomas, IDH mutant, or like glioblastoma. And in case of an unmethylated MGMT promoter, I think we can discuss radio monotherapy. So these are the um, entities and the treatment recommendation we have discussed now. I showed you the recommendation for grade two and grade three oligodendroclial tumors, um, radiotherapy plus six cycle of adjuvant PC regimen. So forget or not the vincristin. Um, we talked about astrocytomas, uh, grade two with risk factors and IDH mutant. Astrocytoma IDH mutant grade three. Um, first recommendation would be radiotherapy plus uh, 12 cycles adjuvant temozolomide. Could discuss for the grade two tumors, of course, the PCV regimen. And um, for the IDH wild type tumors, grade three, as I told you, refer to astrocytomas grade three IDH mutant or glioblastoma. So one subgroup is missing uh, how to treat astrocytoma IDH mutant. Um, uh, with histological features of a glioblastoma, so formerly known the IDH mutant glioblastomas, or uh, the grade three or two tumors, IDH mutant with um, uh, the detection of a CTKN2B deletion. New classification, astrocytoma, IDH mutant, uh, CNS, uh, WHO grade four. It's difficult to, to uh, give you clear evidence for the treatment um, for the uh, treatment recommendation, but at the moment, I would suggest to treat these patients uh, um, like astrocytoma grade, grade three, which means radiotherapy plus 12 cycles temozolomide or like uh, glibus tumors. But we have the data, we don't have the data at the moment. 
So to conclude the whole situation, please be aware for glioblastoma patients, um, combined radiochemotherapy with temozolomide, so the SNP scheme is still alive, so we, we, we still use it, plus minus two modulating fields. So we should discuss this new treatment modality with our patients, I think. Um, there's one biomarker um, which has some clinical impact, MGV promoter methylate, methylation status, then I think uh, I know the people, uh, the colleagues in the in the US don't like this regimen. They try to repeat this trial, but uh, at least in our hand, um, we would um, discuss the combined radiochemotherapy with um, lomastine and uh, plus temozolomide. Consider age, modify treatment regimens for elderly patients, and um, uh, for the uh, grade two and three gliomas. Um, uh, yeah, we need to consider molecular status. We need the neuropathologist, of course. Uh, we should consider risk factors, age, and uh, residual tumor. And then we have, at the moment, in the clinical routine, two different regimens, uh, radiotherapy plus temozolomide and, uh, and radiotherapy plus a PC regimen. So this is so, so easy. It's uh, the so neuro-oncology world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin, for that very clear talk. Um, I think just to, uh, uh, to conduct this session as we've done the others, we'll have the next speaker, which will be Philipp Schucht from Bern in, in Switzerland. And he will tell us about something else that happens after the primary surgery, which is follow up. And of course, there's the issue of recurrence and something that's, uh, interest, that's of interest of all us neurosurgeons when to do a reoperation. So please, Philipp, we are looking forward to your talk. Very well. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, you, you can confirm that you see my screen? Excellent. Uh, so my name is Philippe Schacht. I'm a neurosurgeon, an oncological neurosurgeon here in, in Switzerland. I'm head of our neurocology center as well uh, here in Bern, Switzerland. A few disclosures. Um, what I'd like to do now, and that's kind of the last part of our session today, and, and again, I congratulate uh, the, the, these excellent talks that we had on many aspects of first-line treatment uh, for these astrocytoma. And now we're moving on to glioblastoma and, and thinking of what can we do as surgeons uh, once our therapies, our first-line treatment, including the adamant treatment, has failed. Um, and it, this comes down invariably to the question, how many times are we going to go through surgery with our patients? So when we look at at the value of surgery as such. Uh, again, let's, let's take a, a quick step back and, and look what our surgery does for our patients. And the reason I do this is because we all know that the brain is full of glioblastoma cells by the time patients show up at our office. So why do we even bother? What's, why is it worth it undergoing painful surgery, painful both for the surgeon and the doctor? Uh, one hint of this, and we've seen other evidences, uh, from my point, comes from Walter Stummer's studies. Uh, and the beauty of Walter Stummer's study on 5ALA uh, was the quality of patient recordings. Uh, we, we saw two groups in his studies. He, he uh, defined complete resection as those patients with very, very small remnants or no uh, remnants at all, and then incomplete resection, anything contrast enhancing bigger than about uh, five, uh, cc, uh, 0.5 cc cube. And what he saw in these patients is that what patient with a complete resection live about five months longer. And that's very impressive. Now, why do they actually live longer? Uh, and I think one explanation may be coming from our colleagues in your oncology. Uh, because when they give uh, temozolomide to their patients, it really matters how complete the job was that the surgeon did. Uh, so the additional benefit of having chemotherapy depends on how much tumor cell it has to fight. And the longer we look at these data, it really means that uh, surgery uh, standalone might save the patient from you know, uh, elevated ICP at the very beginning. But on the long run, it's really the combination uh, between our surgeries and additive treatment that seems to make the difference. Now, Let's go to the topic of interest uh, for these last few minutes. Um, should we operate patients again? And, and this is, has been a great concern for us. Now, why? 
with a good initial treatment, patients do fine, they're happy with this, and then they come back and they want it again. And, and the oncologist, um, if they're nice, they want it again as well. They say, okay, it worked the first time, patient lived for a year or two, uh, let's do this again. Um, when we look back to older studies, now these are all older studies looking at the value of a second surgery for glioblastoma overall survival. It's a bit ambiguous. A lot of, of the trials uh, show the benefit. Uh, some did not. Now let's quickly have a look at these trials and at the evidence that we have for doing uh, more than one surgery for this patient. I would like to start with this study. Um, this study from, yeah, this was a multi-center study and I think which a lot of our centers participated. This is Florian Ringel. Uh, and what they've done in their studies is they, they basically pulled from a lot of centers, we contributed as well, uh, and we pulled these patients together, then looked how long they live. And we figured out that our patients live about two years if we've done several surgeries and not even one year if we do not do surgery on them again. And so on the comes to the conclusion, while well, that's doing surgical resections for recurrent glioblastoma, may help to prolong patient survival at an acceptable complication rate. And I think there are two or three important points that we should consider. So there seems to be some kind of an association between operated patients and longer survival. Yes, there's a question of causality. Um, does this longer survival have anything to do with what we've done? And then the question is of what is an acceptable complication rate for the patient's life? Here's another one uh, from Trajana, a study that I liked a lot from the US. Uh, and, and I think as the chart gets simpler, it, it shows us more and more the main problem of these retrospective analysis. Uh, so here, this is a very famous institution, Hopkins in, in the US, and, and they looked at patients had only one surgery, black curve, or, or two surgeries, blue, red, uh, three surgeries, red curve. And so patients, yes, so, you know, the more surgeries they have, they live longer. The problem, of course, here is who are these unfortunate souls who only got one resection? I mean, they waited away very, very quickly. And, and so the question comes up, you know, did these patients maybe just, these patients with several resections, they just lived long. And, and so there was a lot of time for us to do more surgeries, and there might be no causality among the numbers of surgeries that we've done and the time they've lived. And actually, Jochana himself is, is very skeptical about this. And just, you know, describes this correlation or the, this, uh, but, but questions the causality. And here, just for completeness sake, uh, that's the very last one, just very recent, uh, another group, uh, uh, this time from Poland, who did a great job at, at comparing patients. So they, they compared 36 of the reoperated patients uh, to their 129 non-reoperated, did some form of matching, and from a statistical point of view, very well done. And at the end, they come up with a significant survival benefit again. Um, you know, almost or getting to two years patients who had two surgeries, blue curve against those unfortunate ones with only one surgery um, who had a survival of uh, far not even one year. Again here, the problem is, and I'll try to show you with this curve that the blue, red, the light uh, red curve on the left, that's the three months. Um, and you know, if somebody shows up at our practice with a recurrence, normally you do have couple of months to live. Uh, here we see about 20% dead within the first three months in, in the, in, uh, the non-reoperated group, uh, almost half of them dead by six months. So a very poor, um, very poor prognosis for patients who did not undergo, or let's put it different, they were not offered the second surgery. And this at the end is the problem of all these studies and why we're still stuck uh, with these questions. Is because even here, these, these are excellent centers. They have a multidisciplinary team which decides on offering surgery or not. And like in other other centers, 75% of patients are not being offered a second surgery. Uh, and normally it's difficult to say why patient may be kind of uh, end of therapy from his own perspective. He doesn't want to do anything any anymore. There can be many reasons why we 
not offer, uh, but the reality is we only offer second surgery to quite few, normally about 20, 25% of our patients. And the problem really is that, that this selection bias is very difficult to get out of these retrospective analysis. And I have to say that one of the trials I like most uh, was this trial, a uh, trial done in Australia, where they, uh, by, by a, a neurosurgeon called Scully, uh, and they try now to, to um, calculate the risk of these additional uh, variables. So they, they looked at the overall survival, again, reoperated a uh, second time, has a higher survival benefit. And then the more they try to correct for negative uh, factors, such as old age, uh, Paul Kanowski said, is the more and more the survival benefit vanishes. And then um, if we ask our colleagues from neuro-oncology, they come up with this kind of graphs. As uh, so I know, that these are people uh, working at the ERTC, and they see a lot of negative trials, right? Because they, they, they've done a series, I mean, that, that's what they do on a daily basis, uh, producing a phase two uh, trials, looking for some trends, for survival trends. Um, as we know, almost always negative. Uh, now, they pulled the series of these randomized controlled trials, and then they looked how people did depending on whether they got another surgery or not. Now, it turns out that the um, median overall survival uh, in these patients was 8.1 months. Completely relevant, uh, regardless of whether we, they've done a second surgery or not. So again, these are not, not trials on surgery. These are trials on some components. Uh, but then looking at, and, and all the components were negative uh, for, the, for the effect, uh, but then looking at survival, and so from a new oncological point of view, uh, very little benefit of having a second surgery. And then to make it worse, actually, what are acceptable, acceptable neurological uh, deficits? Um, again, here we have a series of studies. I'm just picking one out from Hoover, uh, who looked at various problems that may occur during surgery, uh, deficits. Um, first surgery, normally, I think, in, in the hands of in all our hands, uh, certainly below 10%, probably around 3 to 5%. And that somehow increases um, in second, third, and fourth surgery to double digit range. Uh, we can have regional complication, wound healing problems, we can have systematic complication. And yes, about one out of 10 of our patients at the end loses KPS and hence loses quality of life. Um, so if we take all of these together, the deficits, the, the complication, uh, the loss in the KPS, and probably also the inability to join any other trial or any other second surgery because you have to deal with the complication, um, it is nothing that speaks against a second surgery, but something to consider before doing second surgery on our patients. So. In a conclusion, um, I think there are a couple of things we have to uh, keep in mind in all of these uh, trials and when counseling our patient. The first one, there is no uh, definite result, or that definite um, study out that tells us that we should do or we should not do surgery. Uh, from the current literature, this is just not uh, deducible. Um, I think that most patients, most of these uh, trials um, and, and the most positive ones, they did an excellent job at selecting the good patients because that's what, what, what they've done, at least that, that they selected those patients who will do well and they were scheduled for surgery. And patients who, you know, somehow had poor prognostics factor and it didn't, were not uh, favorable, uh, were not offered a second surgery. So we, we're certainly good at doing this. We should hence uh, offer surgery, I believe, uh, because yes, there might be a survival benefit, which is not very sure about it. And I think we should be honest to this with our patients. And we should, and now again, based on Stubbs trials and, and similar trials, we should especially offer it to, uh, to patients when we have a second adjuvant treatment in mind. I don't believe we should offer it as a single uh, standalone therapy. And we should ask our neuropathologists, now oncologists, you know, is, is there a benefit for having new tissue? 
uh, do you want to do next generation sequencing? Is, is this something else uh, that makes sense to look at this issue? Then we should also always, and I think we always do the page, we should acknowledge um, that it takes valuable days away. Many of these patients don't have very long to live uh, and doing a second surgery takes time um, at the hospital. It has risks uh, and in all patients, it delays adjuvant treatment in some uh, longer than we would want. Uh, regardless to say, I think uh, as many of you do uh, in our centers as well, we, um, we do about 25% of our patients, we offer them second surgery. And this is what comes out uh, when we talk to new oncologists. And I think all these guidelines are very, very similar. They say that the evidence level is very poor. Um, but then, uh, you know, it's, it's really up to the surgeon, the oncologist, and, and the patient. And lastly, as always in this kind of try, um, situation, where we talk about uh, surgical problems, but we do not have a clear recommendation. Uh, we've seen the oncologists that talk about. Uh, evidence level 4C, that's about as bad as it gets. Uh, we need better evidence. Uh, I congratulate to, uh, our colleagues in the north uh, who are doing you know, surgical trials on fluorectomy compared to gadolinum demarge tumors. And I think uh, we should try to do this as often as possible. We need better evidence. Uh, the intervention we do have so significant uh, risks, but also benefits for our patients. We really need better numbers on what their worth is. Uh, at the moment, there's a research trial going on, uh, a trial with 24 European centers uh, where we actually do exactly these randomized patients for against the second surgery uh, treatments. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Philip. Um, thank you very much for this uh, really good talk. Um, let me, before we start with the discussion, maybe one organizational uh, remark. It, it looks like that Rachel will not be able to join us for very, well, neurosurgical reasons. She's still in the OR. So I think what we'll do is we'll ask her to record the talk anyway, and that can be later accessed by the audience via the ENS website. I think that's a good solution, also given the fact that it's probably the uh, 7 p.m. Um, in the uh, question and answers department, I have one question, and that is actually for Martin. Um, you've talked about chemotherapy, but what about immunotherapy? What about genetic therapies? Is there something on the horizon that we can expect in the well next couple of years? That's difficult to answer. I mean, these are pretty cool concepts, of course, and the whole world uh, likes immunotherapy since we have tremendous success in, uh, in other tumors like melanoma or, or lung cancer or whatever. But the reality in, in brain tumors is all the checkpoint trials and all the checkmate trials failed, were negative um, uh, with checkpoint inhibition. And uh, yeah, at the moment we try to optimize, for example, some different vaccination strategies, neopeptide vaccination uh, in combination with checkpoint inhibition. This is I think a quite interesting concept and it, it, it seems that this concept works. We can induce um, the, we can direct the immune system against the tumor, but at the moment we do not really know if the patient benefit. This was, it's the same case with the trial. Um, uh, uh, Michel Blatten performed the IDH uh, mutation vaccination um, uh, for the grade two to four um, uh, uh, pleomers interesting concept, but not really clear um, as well benefit, but it was only a phase one, two trial. And yeah, the genetic therapy question, that's difficult. I mean, this is an old story, um, which has yeah, a revival in the last years. It's local therapy, um, many concepts. Tim Klaus, you presented, I think several years ago, his uh, TOCA, what was it called? TOCA um, 511 trial. Uh, with a virus construct, um, a non lytic virus with a compound that could induce chemosensitivity, negative results. Then there was, an, in, in the last, I think, two years, an interesting concept, um, forgot the name, the virus was called DNX, and even a, num a number I don't know exactly, an oncolytic virus, which could induce um, uh, some kind of immune response. And the, in the trial, it was combined with uh, Pembro, Lisumab, a checkpoint inhibition. Um, it was interesting preliminary results, but 
I'm not really convinced by this genetic approach. So I think let's 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 wait for the um, for the uh, vaccination strategies. But I think I, I'm afraid that this will take ten years or more. Okay. Um, I, I have a question that 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 well. Not, not goes so much into the future and future and, and very exciting therapies, but but old therapies. I, I seem to remember the CCNO. Well, it's very very old, right? And timosolomide is not really an all uh, interesting and an all exciting uh, uh, drug. Still, they seem to work in glioma, and we know that for now a couple of days. Why doesn't anything else work? I mean, in in all those other oncology uh, uh, worlds, other standard chemotherapeutic agents have been found to work. And why is it that in glioma, everything stopped after two alkylating agents? I'm not talking about, you know, the apps and ips and so forth. I'm talking about the old stuff. Why is that? I don't know. If I could solve or answer this question, uh, I could retire, I think. I don't know. Um, the other question is, I mean, uh, we talk about immune therapy. Um, and 20 years ago, we talked about intensified chemo strategies. Now we, we received the results with a more or less more intense um, combination strategy um, with two alkylating old compounds, but with the best chemotherapy results. How about increasing the dose? It's, it's a somewhat high dose chemotherapy. I know this is not attractive, um, but you know from our, our uh, um, cooperation in Bonn, we treated, I think, a small mm. population with a, a very interesting survival data. Um, if I had it, we published it, I don't know, five or six years ago, uh, with progression-free survival times of 14, um, uh, 14 months and longer. And, uh, and how about all the precision neuro-oncology strategies? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have clear answers for your, for your question. Okay. I think there's a question actually from the panel. Christine Jung wants to ask us, was, wants to ask Martin a question. Yeah, well, um, Martin Glass, uh, thank you very much for your talk. What is your opinion on treating elderly patients, meaning um, over the age of 40, which is a negative prognostic factor with a gross total resection? What's your opinion on that? So who grade two gliomas older than 40, gross total resection, treatment, yes or no? Which kind of tumor, oligodendroglial or astrocytoma? Oh, oligo or IDH mutant astrocytoma. Yeah, <laughs> I receive uh, difficult questions. I mean, um, it's a 50-50 question, I think. Uh, for oligodendroglial tumors, cross-total resected, um, older than, what does it mean, older than 40? 40, 41, I think it's legitimate to discuss uh, what should wait then. Um, I mean, we have progression-free survival times of 10 years and longer, and, and why should we combine radiochemotherapy for, for those young patients? Um, with all the issues of neurotoxicity and whatever. And it's, it's a little bit different for the astrocytomas, but um, uh, it's, I think, legitimate too to discuss uh, watch and wait. In, in my hands, uh, astrocytomas, I mean, uh, let, let it answer uh, different. If you see an indication for, for the treatment, and that's, that's the point we can make for the moment, if you would like to treat, you should combine it, radio and chemotherapy and not use monotherapy. But the time point of indication, that's not solved. That's the issue of um, some ongoing trials at the moment. Thanks. I'm just uh, looking no more in the question answer department. Um, then, then I have a question for Philippe. Um, when, when you consider re, uh, repeat surgery for a glioma, what, what is the impact of histology? For example, astrocytoma versus oligo versus glioblastoma, number one and number two, which is more or less into the same direction. What about molecular markers or more precisely, do you make, does it make a difference for you when you decide upon, when you decide if you want to do a repeat surgery, if it, for example, the glioblastoma is methylated or not methylated? Excellent question. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, and I think you, you touched on a very important point um, resectability is one out of many questions facing the this is decision. Uh, yes, sometimes we can take it out. Uh, there's always a risk to it. And then we have to look further. Um, and I think the, the things that you point out, I mean, 
the histology, especially in low grades, but then all the way to the high grades, is it methylated? This will impact uh, the additional adjuvant and treatment you can give these patients. So an older patient, MD MGMT, non-methylated, if you know, we quickly go to the end of what we have to offer in these patients. Uh, and, and if the oncologist tells me, you know, you're happy to do surgery, but I, I don't, I, there's nothing really I can offer this patient, um, you know, anything further than just giving more temozolomide, which hasn't worked uh, before. Then I think this is something that should limit us in, in doing surgeries on this patient. Um, but, you know, if the oncologist tells me, great, you know, give me a bit more, give me new tissue, be non methylated, have something in mind, um, this is really then something which, which I think should uh, push us to do surgery in these patients. Um, so this is for the glioblastoma. In, in the lower grades, grade two, grade three, uh, we are much more aggressive than in the glioblastoma, uh, especially because as many speakers have pointed out now, these, these patients live long uh, and, and our treatment, uh, you know, it works even better than it works uh, in the high grades. And I think getting these tumors smaller, uh, we should try in all patients. All right, thank you very much. Um, seems like we've been able to answer all questions. So I think we can uh, stop at this point. This was a very, very exciting webinar, as I pointed out in the beginning, the first webinar of the tumor section. And I think there was a good experience and we will repeat that shortly, though with another topic and not with gliomas, but glioma was certainly a very good start. I'd like to thank all the panelists. I'd like to thank all the audience and all the uh, participants in the, discussion, in the discussion. So hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Matthias. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank Bye. You.